Chapter 1. Longbourn, 6th February, 1812. The view out of the drawing-room windows was not a cheerful one. The grasses lay dead and brown on grey dust, the trees bare and leafless and occasionally shivering in a chill wind. Twiggy bushes and shrubs hunkered low to the ground beneath a dismal, cloudy sky. In contrast, indoors was delightfully pleasant. A generous fire warmed the room where Mrs. Bennet reclined gracefully across the sofa as she dozed. Lydia and Kitty had both claimed chairs near the fire, each happily reading a novel from the lending library in Meryton, occasionally giggling or sighing, depending on where they were in their respective plots. Elizabeth sat near the window, a basket of sewing forgotten at her feet. Her attention was alternately on the dark skeletal trees, stark against the pale sky outside, and her sisters as they whispered together about their books. Her mother gave a faint snore, and Elizabeth glanced over, noting with vague sympathy that Mrs. Bennet's famed nerves must have kept her awake again the previous night. A tap at the door drew her attention, and she looked over as their butler entered with a silver tray expertly balanced on his hand. A letter for you, Miss Elizabeth, he said properly, crossing to her and lowering his tray. Thank you, Elizabeth replied, taking the letter eagerly. It was, she observed, from her aunt Madeline Gardner, who lived in London with her husband and four children. At the moment, Elizabeth's elder sister Jane was staying with the Gardners, and Elizabeth was eager to hear further word of her beloved sister, who had suffered a heartbreak the previous autumn. She broke the wax seal, spread open the pages, and turned a little in order to avail herself of the light coming through the window. 3rd February, 1812. Dear Lizzie, I do not know how long I will have before the children want me, so I will write immediately of Jane as I know you are concerned about her. You are quite correct to believe that she suffers periods of despondency over the desertion of Mr. Bingley. I do feel quite badly for her. She has such a tender heart. I was here, of course, when the young man's sister came to visit. Based on Miss Bingley's behaviour, I would say that Jane is well served at being separated from her former beau. What an intolerable woman! She was rude to my maids and haughty and discourteous to me and Jane. I understand that Mr. Bingley is substantially different from his sister, and I suppose I can believe it. Siblings do vary so much, do they not? Now, having briefly discussed Jane's difficulties in romance, may I ask a gentle question about Mr. George Wickham? Was certainly a most handsome and charming man, but given his lack of fortune... Well, Lizzie, I hope that you are not encouraging him too much. He cannot support you or any children, and it would be most unwise to form a strong attachment to the young... Oh, I was just interrupted, and I have shocking news. Well, I am surprised, though perhaps I ought not to be. But I am babbling, and in a letter, which is quite absurd. Dear Lizzie, I just received word that Annabel Simpson is dead. I know you will grieve, as I do, such a fine old lady who, I'm confident, derived great delight from your extensive correspondence in the last years. Do you remember how you used to write very seriously of the kittens in the stable and your antics in climbing oak trees? I visited her only two weeks ago, and she seemed cheerful enough, though frail. Her heart had been giving her trouble, it seemed, but I never imagined. She lived a good, long life. She was almost seventy years of age. I'm pleased to know that she is with our Lord, but I will miss her wry wit. The children do want me now. With much love, Madeline Gardner. Elizabeth bit her lip, gulped and felt tears start in her eyes. Annabel Simpson was dead. She could immediately conjure up in her mind's eye the straight-backed form of the wealthy old lady who had proven an amusing and faithful correspondent these last years. Elizabeth would miss her comments on London life and the foibles of mankind. Lizzie, why are you crying? Is something wrong with Jane? Mrs. Bennet suddenly cried out, causing Elizabeth to jerk in surprise. No, no, she replied, turning to face her mother, who was now sitting up and staring at her with worried eyes. No, Jane is well enough. But I suppose she has not seen Mr. Bingley, the lady of the house demanded. No, she has not, 
Elizabeth replied, and then, eager to head off any wailing about Mr. Bingley's desertion, continued, Aunt Gardner tells me that Mrs. Annabel Simpson has died. Oh, Mrs. Bennet replied, her eyes shifting back and forth rapidly. Elizabeth, who knew her mother very well, knew that the lady wished to complain about Mr. Bingley's betrayal, but also was curious about the death of Mrs. Simpson, even though the woman was a comparative stranger to the matron of Longbourn. Who is Mrs. Annabel Simpson? Kitty asked curiously, which tipped the scales in Elizabeth's preferred direction. No, oh, she was an elderly relation of your Aunt Gartner, Mrs. Bennet said. No, I do not entirely remember how they were related. Mrs. Simpson is, was Aunt Gardner's great aunt on her father's side, Elizabeth explained. She must have been very old, Kitty remarked. She was almost seventy years of age, Elizabeth agreed. Have I ever met her? The girl asked, her brow knitted in thought. No, her elder sister replied. I visited her a number of times while spending time with our London relatives, but I've not seen her in two or three years. I wrote to her regularly, however, and she wrote back with equal regularity. I will miss our correspondence. You were writing to an old woman, Lydia asked, tossing her dark curls. How very dull. Mrs. Simpson was not dull in the least, Elizabeth replied, smothering her usual indignation over Lydia's cavalier attitude toward the elderly. She had quite an interesting life. A scandalous one, you mean, Mrs. Bennet huffed. This, naturally enough, caused her two youngest daughters to perk up in excitement. Scandalous, Lydia demanded, her blue eyes now gleaming with excitement. How was it scandalous? I do not remember the details, her mother admitted. I do, and it was not so terribly scandalous, Elizabeth said. It is merely, well, Aunt Gardner's paternal grandfather was the fourth son of a baron, while Mrs. Simpson was the baron's only daughter, born rather late in his life. There was not a great deal of money in the family, and Mrs. Simpson, thanks to her lack of dowry, was unable to garner an offer from a rich gentleman. She chose instead to marry a wealthy widower who had two sons from his first marriage and was also a merchant. Society was scandalized, but Mrs. Simpson preferred a comfortable life to genteel poverty. Moreover, she and her husband were happy together. Lydia wrinkled her nose and said, I cannot imagine marrying an old man for his money. I intend to marry a handsome officer who wears a red coat. Only if he has enough money, Lydia, her mother said reprovingly. It is all very well to marry for love if the gentleman has sufficient funds, but you would not enjoy mending your own clothes and cooking your own meals, would you? This was remarkably sensible advice, especially since Mrs. Bennet was so violently eager to marry off her daughters that she often drove possible suitors away with her enthusiasm. Indeed, that was why Mr. George Wickham, the most charming and handsome man of Elizabeth's acquaintance, was not an eligible suitor. Elizabeth blew out a breath and forced herself to relax her tightened fists. Mr. Wickham should be an eligible suitor, but he had been unhappily used by another handsome man of her acquaintance, Mr. Darcy of Pemberley. Mr. Wickham, godson to Mr. Darcy's father, was intended for the church, and indeed the elder Mr. Darcy had set aside a valuable living in Derbyshire for his godson, but when the living had fallen vacant only a few years previously, Mr. Darcy had given it to another. I so wish that Mr. Wickham had money, Lydia exclaimed in a strange echo of Elizabeth's thoughts. He is quite the most handsome, charming man I've ever met, and such a fine dancer. He's wooing Mary King now, though, Kitty remarked. Of course he is, but only because she recently inherited ten thousand pounds the youngest Miss Bennet declared. It is quite shocking, really. She has so many freckles. Handsome young men must have something to live on as well as plain ones, Elizabeth pointed out regretfully. The world is so unfair sometimes, Lydia complained, and Elizabeth could only sigh in agreement. Drawing Room The Next Day the door to the drawing room opened, and Mr. Bennet entered, which provoked his wife and four younger daughters to look up in surprise. 
It still lacked two hours to dinner, and the master of Longbourn invariably spent the majority of the day closeted in his library, away from the chattering of his wife and younger daughters. Elizabeth often spent time in the library with him, but today she had not. She was grieving over the loss of Mrs. Simpson, and her father's sardonic view of life and death would not be a great comfort. Elizabeth, Mr. Bennet said, will you please join me in the study? Of course, father, Elizabeth replied, setting aside her needlework, standing up and shaking out her skirts. Is something the matter, Mr. Bennet? Mrs. Bennet asked fretfully. No, nothing is wrong, her husband replied. Come along, Lizzie. She did so, departing with Lydia and Kitty's giggles in her wake. Her youngest sisters seemed to find amusement in the most ridiculous of events, which was, in Elizabeth's view, a great pity. She herself liked to laugh, but not at everything and anything. She followed her father down the corridor that led to the study, which was adjacent to the library. Mr. Bennet opened the study door, and Elizabeth passed through and stopped in joyful surprise. Uncle Gardner, she exclaimed, and then rushed forward to embrace her favorite uncle. Oh, what a delightful surprise this is! She stepped back, her eyes suddenly widening in distress. Is it Jane? Or Aunt Gardner or the children? Has something happened? Nothing bad has happened, Elizabeth, Mr. Gardner said immediately and forced a smile. Elizabeth, regarding him carefully, noticed that his forehead was creased in thought. But Mr. Gardner was a truthful man, so she knew that Jane and her other relations were well. Why are you here, sir? she asked, taking a seat next to the fire, which was crackling pleasantly. Mr. Bennet and Mr. Gardner took seats in chairs across from her, and Gardner, after blowing out a breath, said, Elizabeth, my dear, Madeline sent you a letter recently. Did you receive it? I received it yesterday, Elizabeth said, and sighed mournfully. Mrs. Simpson is dead. Yes, she is, Mr. Gardner agreed, and tilted his head thoughtfully. You were grieved? I am. I met her in person less than a dozen times, but we had a robust correspondence for the last eight years. She was such an interesting woman, and so kind to write regularly to a twelve-year-old as if she were quite a young lady. She sniffed and dabbed at her eyes with a handkerchief, and then managed a shaky smile. Yes, I will miss her. That explains it, at least partially, Mr. Bennet said cryptically. Explains what? Elizabeth asked. It appears that you have inherited some money from the lady, her father said. Yes, you have, her uncle said. Yesterday I met with Mrs. Simpson's solicitor, uh, Mr. Harris, at his request, and you are a legatee in the lady's will, as is Jane. Elizabeth's brows raised in surprise. Truly, that seems startling, as we are not even blood relations. Truly, Mr. Gardiner said, and cleared his throat before saying, Mrs. Simpson left you seventy thousand pounds. Elizabeth froze, goggled, and finally gasped out, What? Elizabeth has inherited seven thousand pounds? Mr. Bennet demanded, his usually sardonic expression replaced by open astonishment. Elizabeth has inherited seventy thousand pounds, Mr. Gardiner corrected. Seventy thousand. Elizabeth swayed a little and reached out her hands to brace herself on the arms of her chair. That, that is impossible. Chapter Two the Library, Longbourn. Gertrude pushed the door of the library and stepped in cautiously. She had been instructed by the housekeeper, Mrs. Hill, to clean the grate of the fireplace in the library because the master was currently busy elsewhere. Gertrude knew, as did everyone in Longbourn, that Mr. Bennet was accustomed to spending every spare hour in the library and was almost always settled near the library fire at this hour of the day, 
Mr. Bennet was not an unkind master, but she had no desire to intrude on him unnecessarily. But Mrs. Hill was correct. The room was empty, though the door to the adjacent office was cracked open, and she could hear Mr. Bennet and Miss Lizzie speaking with an unknown gentleman. Gertrude hurried over to the fireplace along the east wall and began sweeping it. It was not a task that required much attention, and thus the girl found herself listening vaguely and then intently to the conversation next door in the study. Mrs. Simpson left you seventy thousand pounds, the stranger declared. What? cried Miss Elizabeth, obviously in disbelief. Elizabeth has inherited seven thousand pounds? asked the master in unmistakable amazement. Elizabeth has inherited seventy thousand pounds, the unknown voice declared. Seventy thousand Gertrude gasped aloud and then covered her mouth with one hand. Seventy thousand pounds? She could not even imagine so great a sum as one thousand pounds, but seventy. Miss Elizabeth would be very rich indeed. She finished sweeping the fireplace and hurried quietly out of the library, smiling to herself. She liked Miss Bennet and Miss Elizabeth very much, both were kind to the maids and did not make enormous messes for the servants to clean up. Miss Mary was also pleasant, but the youngest two, Mrs. Bennet, were very annoying indeed, scattering clothing around, romping around in light clothing and getting it dirty, and so on. She knew that the Bennet girls would lose Longbourn when their father died, but with so vast a fortune, Miss Elizabeth would be well enough, as would her mother and sisters. It was wonderful news. The Study Mr. Gardner sighed and said, I am quite as shocked as you both are, I assure you. I am not even Mrs. Simpson's blood relation, Elizabeth repeated, her face pale. It does not make sense. The will itself is, of course, with Mrs. Simpson's solicitor, but I remember the gist of it, her uncle said. Mrs. Simpson was very fond of both Madeline and you, and made special note in an accompanying document that neither of you ever asked for money. Apparently she was the subject of multiple demands from various relations over the years, and grew quite weary of it. Does this mean that Aunt Gardner inherited money as well? Elizabeth asked, her brow furrowed. Oh, yes, I should have mentioned that, her uncle said, and then cleared his throat and added sheepishly, but I confess to some discomfort. The truth is that Madeline inherited ninety thousand pounds and the house on Half Moon Street from her great aunt. Mr. Bennet, who had been doing rapid sums in his head, said, Elizabeth, your bequest will bring you almost three thousand pounds in the four percent. Elizabeth wiped her mouth with her handkerchief, more for something to do than anything else, and said, That... It seems impossible, Uncle Gardner. What of her other relations? Surely they deserve the money more than I do. Madeline and you are the primary beneficiaries, her uncle said. But Mrs. Simpson left a few hundred pounds here and there for other relatives and long-time servants, and Jane received three thousand pounds. Oh, I am glad she remembered Jane, Elizabeth cried out. I know that they did not know one another particularly well, but no one is more deserving than Jane. Is there any chance that anyone will contest the will? Mr. Bennet demanded, having partially recovered from the shock of learning that his second daughter was now wealthier than he was. Mr. Harris assured me that the legal documents are watertight, Mr. Gardner said, but let me explain some of the background. Mr. Simpson, who has been dead for twenty-odd years, was previously married and his first wife birthed two fine sons— she tragically died of consumption many years ago, and Mr. Simpson married Miss Annabel Beaumont, daughter of Lord Beaumont, Baron, a few years later. The new Mrs. Simpson was a good deal younger than her husband, and thus it is not surprising that she was widowed while still middle-aged. Mr. Gardner paused to see whether his audience of two had any questions, but both remained silent, their entire attention fixed on him.
When Mr. Simpson died, he continued, he left his property equally divided between his two sons and his wife. Mrs. Simpson was a canny woman and invested wisely, partly with me and my business in these last years, and also lived a moderately frugal life for a woman of means. Her stepsons were more reckless, unfortunately. Unfortunate, if not surprising, Mr. Bennet muttered. Oh, quite. In the five and twenty years since she was widowed, Mrs. Simpson transformed a large sum into a substantial fortune. During her lifetime, she was asked by her stepsons and her stepsons relations for money, and was moderately open-handed in the beginning, but she cut them off when they continued behaving recklessly. She cared deeply for you and your aunt, and decided to make you her primary beneficiaries. Silence fell for a minute, and Elizabeth, who prided herself on her quick response to situations, found herself struck dumb with disbelief. The money, where is it? Mr. Bennet finally inquired. Much of it is in government securities, and some is in investments. I have been named executor of the will, along with Mrs. Simpson's man of business, and will be responsible for looking after Lizzie's bequest until she is of age. Elizabeth felt herself relax a little at this. She would turn one and twenty in five months, and it was a relief to know that she was not actually mistress of a great fortune at the moment, though she would be soon. Well, Elizabeth, her father said, Congratulations on your sudden acquisition of wealth. Thank you, she replied, sounding uncertain. She chuckled and said, I, it is such a shock, father, I still wonder if I'm dreaming. I understand, her uncle remarked with a rueful smile. I am considerably older than you are and I keep pinching myself. We were very comfortable in the past, but this inheritance will change our lives considerably. I hope for the better. You hope? Mr. Bennet asked, lifting an eyebrow. What is it that Christ said? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? Of course, this surprise bequest is wonderful, but there will doubtless be challenges as well. Like indigent relatives knocking on your door? Mr. Bennet mused. Yes, exactly. Madeline and I both have cousins and nephews and nieces who need financial assistance and will have to be sensible about using our new fortune wisely. I do not wish to encourage a dissolute lifestyle in anyone. The tradesman sighed, shook his head, and turned toward Elizabeth. So that is the situation. You still have some months before you can access the principal, but I would be glad to arrange for you to use some of the money as you wish, Lizzie. Oh, his niece replied. She pondered for a moment and then said, I do not wish for any funds now, Uncle. I know you will look after my affairs well enough, and I am still so bewildered over what has come to pass that I cannot think clearly. That is very sensible her uncle declared, and her father, who had been stroking his chin thoughtfully, said, Do you wish for your mother and sisters to know of your new riches, Elizabeth? Elizabeth groaned, wrinkled her nose, and asked, What do you think, father? It would be unwise to tell them, Mr. Bennet replied promptly. Your mother and sisters will endlessly beg for money for ribbons and lace and new dresses and the like. Elizabeth turned questioning eyes on her uncle, who said, I agree that it would be unwise to share news of your sudden acquisition of wealth with my sister and my younger nieces, though perhaps for different reasons. As a rich single woman, you will be the subject of great interest from gentlemen in desire of a wife. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single lady in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a husband. Elizabeth suggested, arching one eyebrow. Both men laughed, and her father remarked, Very good, my dear, very good. Your uncle is quite right. Do give me a moment to think, please, Elizabeth requested. Her male relatives lapsed into silence for a full five minutes, until finally Elizabeth said,
I will not tell them of the entire sum, but I would like to tell my mother and sisters that I have inherited money from Mrs. Simpson, which will provide close to £700 a year in income. That will comfort my mother. In order to keep the begging down, perhaps we can tell them that I do not yet have access to the money? Yes, that is quite in order, her uncle remarked. The money will be tied up for some time, as everything is sorted out. Mama is very worried about the entail, you know. Elizabeth said, her dark eyes solemn. If something were to happen to father... They would all be cast into the hedgerows, Mr. Bennet finished with the return to his own sardonic manner. You know that your Uncle Phillips and I would not permit such a thing, Mr. Gardiner said sternly. Elizabeth smiled at him gratefully. I know you would do what you could, but you have children of your own and they are your primary responsibility. If I'm truly going to be mistress of nearly £3,000 a year, I will be able to care for my mother and sisters with ease, and I will do so. You may find that more difficult than you imagine, Mr. Bennet said in the driest tone his voice was capable of conveying. Elizabeth's expression hardened and her chin came up. With all due respect, Father, I believe that I am more stubborn than you are regarding such things. Mr. Bennet, who had already been shocked today, was shocked again. Elizabeth was his favourite daughter, and they usually coexisted happily, and yet there was a thread of indignation in that statement. He turned toward his brother-in-law, whose own expression was carefully blank. I do not suppose you understand how difficult it is to withstand the pleading of your mother and sisters, he said truculently. Elizabeth stared at him for a moment, and then said, I suppose I do not. But since I too have been living with uncertainty about my future when you die, father, I have an extra incentive to manage money well. Her father looked genuinely amazed at this, which Elizabeth found both surprising and exasperating. She was an intelligent woman, and knew well that it would be difficult for her mother to support all five of her daughters on a mere two hundred pounds a year, which was all that they would have as interest from the five thousand pounds of her mother's marriage portion. Longbourn, entailed away from the female line, would go to a distant cousin, Mr. Collins. No, not difficult, impossible, given that they had been raised in comparative luxury— Elizabeth had refused to give in to despair, but yes, the situation was dire as all five daughters remained unwed and her father grew older and older. If you were so very concerned about your future, her father said irritably, why did you refuse Mr. Collins's offer? Elizabeth felt a flare of genuine anger and forced herself to breathe in and out a few times before she said, Mr. Collins is a sycophantic fool, father, and he would have driven me entirely mad. I did not respect him, I did not like him, and certainly I could never love him. I am thankful that you supported my refusal to marry the man, and I thought you understood why I did. Of course I did, Lizzie, her father replied, and reached out to take her hands in his own. You would have been completely miserable as his wife. I confess I did not realize that you were so very concerned. He trailed away, shook his head, and then turned an apologetic look on Mr. Gardner, who was watching the scene with studious calm. Brother, Mr. Bennett said, and forced himself to smile. I am certain you are weary after your trip and wish to refresh yourself. I will have one of the maids escort you to your chamber. Perhaps you can come down to the drawing room in an hour, and we will tell the rest of the family about Elizabeth's inheritance? That sounds excellent, Mr. Gardner agreed, and Elizabeth stood up and said, Please allow me to take my uncle upstairs, and then I will take the hour to rest and reflect in my bedchamber. I'm rather overcome. That is completely understandable, her father said. Chapter 3 Library, Darcy House, London In March or early April, it is advisable to shear the Cotswold ewes in preparation for lambing. The Cotswold ewes generally birth 
Elizabeth Bennet stood a few feet inside the breakfast room at Netherfield, her cheeks flushed pink, her fine eyes brightened with exercise. Her sensible pelisse was spattered with mud, and her dusky curls were windswept under her warm cap. I am here to care for my sister, she said to Miss Bingley. May I see her? Darcy shook his head and started reading once more. The Cotswold ewes generally birth one to three lambs. Do you not feel a great inclination, Miss Bennet, to seize such an opportunity of dancing a reel? She looked up at him, her dark eyebrows lifted, her eyes dancing, but did not speak. He stared at her in astonishment and repeated the question. Oh, the lady replied, her exquisite lips curling up in amusement. I heard you before, but I could not immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me, I know, to say yes, that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste, but I always delight in overthrowing those kind of schemes and cheating a person of their premeditated contempt. I have therefore made up my mind to tell you I do not want to dance a reel at all, and now despise me if you dare. Darcy stared down at her, his heart in his throat. Indeed, I do not dare he said. Cotswold ewes generally birth one to three lambs and those with triplets. With a huff of frustration, Fitzwilliam Darcy, master of Pemberley, set the book aside carefully, even when he was distressed he always put books down with respect, and leaned against his favourite wing-backed chair in his favourite room in Darcy House. He adored libraries, and was pleased to be master of not one, but two fine ones. This one, though only a quarter of the size of the library at Pemberley, was full of some of the finest books available to a wealthy gentleman. Usually he could read anything, even a treatise on sheep, with rapt attention, but today, like so many other days of late, his thoughts continually shifted to Miss Elizabeth Bennet of Longbourn, second daughter of a country gentleman and a solicitor's daughter, impecunious with manners that were not those of the fashionable world. Miss Elizabeth Bennet, with her fine eyes and pleasing figure, with her vigour, with her arch smile and clever speech, teased Darcy when no one, not even Bingley, dared. This could not be love, of course. He was far too sensible a gentleman, with far too great an understanding of his own consequence and responsibility toward his family, to fall in love with Miss Elizabeth Bennet. No one. It was merely that she was so very unusual. The ladies of the town, the unmarried ones anyway, either pursued him or ignored him. The latter group was largely composed of the high-born daughters of dukes and marquises, though in truth even some of those young women chased him. Yes, he, with his handsome face and figure, his vast fortune, his great estate and close connections to the Earl of Matlock, was a great matrimonial prize. Elizabeth had never mentioned his wealth, never hung on his arm or complimented his writing. Did she know how very effective her manners were in capturing his interest? Probably. He hoped she had not been too distressed when he left Netherfield a few months previously. She must have known that, in spite of his obvious attraction to water, there was really no hope of an offer of marriage. Their positions in life were too disparate. It would fade, this bizarre, uncomfortable longing to return to Hertfordshire, to ride to Longbourn, to ask her father for his blessing, to take her as his wife. Surely it would fade. Half Moon Street, London Mrs. Madeline Gardner squared her shoulders and marched up the shallow steps to the front door of the house on Half Moon Street. Her eldest niece, Jane Bennet, followed her up, though more slowly, as she took her time looking at the neighbouring homes. It was a fashionable neighbourhood, Half Moon Street, and substantially more genteel than Gracechurch Street. Mrs. Gardner knocked on the door with her fist, as the knocker had been taken down, and a full two minutes later the door opened to reveal a clean, well-kept maid of some five-and-twenty years, who looked bewildered but said courteously, I apologise, madam, but the mistress of the house is not available. 
Mrs. Gardner smiled and said, I am the new mistress, actually. I am Mrs. Madeline Gardner, and Mrs. Simpson bequeathed this house to me in her will. Oh, the woman cried out. Oh, my apologies, Mum. I, I will... Um, please do step in, and I will summon the housekeeper. The two ladies stepped into the small entrance room, and the maid shut the door behind them and scurried off. Jane and Mrs. Gardner looked about with interest as they divested themselves of their outer wrappings and hats. The furniture was sturdy and scrupulously clean, the parquet floor was unsmudged by mud or dirt, and the porcelain vase of dried roses set on the small entry table was free of any dust or crumbling. Beneath the flowers, the empty silver card tray was polished and shining, reflecting the roses above it. Mrs. Gardner looked up from her examination as a middle-aged woman hurried into the room, an anxious expression on her face, and exclaimed, Mrs. Gardner, my profound apologies. I did not realise you intended to visit today. The new owner of the house bestowed a warm smile on the woman and said, Indeed, I did not know myself, but it was a lovely day for February and my children were content with their nursemaids, and I decided to make a hasty trip here with my eldest niece. But please, I know we have met before, but I confess to having forgotten your name. I am Mrs. Ripley, madam. Mrs. Ripley, my niece Jane and I wish to walk around the house and inspect it. I visited my great-aunt many times, but never went upstairs. Would you like me to accompany you, madam? Oh, no, that is not necessary. Would it be possible for Jane and me to have tea after we have completed our tour? Oh, yes, certainly. Would you like tea in the drawing room or the dining parlour? Oh, the drawing room, I think, and if the fire has not been started, could you arrange to have it lit? Of course, Mrs. Ripley replied, and hurried off. Shall we start on this level? Madeline suggested. Arm in arm, the two women wandered from one room to the next. They started in the drawing room, with its delicate mauve and hints of purple, with classical sturdy furniture and a simple, currently unlit fireplace. A sitting room was to the left of the drawing room, made up in glorious peach with comfortable chairs and sofas. Jane wandered over to examine a set of porcelain figurines, while Madeline Gardner ran a thoughtful finger across the clean mantel and checked the merrily ticking clock against her watch. The next sitting room was all done up in shades and hues of blue, with a stunning seascape painting on one wall. Jane settled onto a settee and leaned back against a plump cushion, looking around. It was chilly in the room, with no fire lit, but utterly spotless. Mrs. Gardner wandered over to examine the painting and the frame and found no dust there either. The elegant dining room and the study, also on the first floor, were equally well maintained. The sturdy oaken desk was polished and Mrs. Gardner took a moment to browse the books on the shelves behind it, mostly ledgers and accounting books neatly organised by date. Jane settled into the leather upholstered chair in front of the desk with only the slightest creak, it had likely not been replaced since Mrs. Simpson's husband had passed on to his reward, but it had been built to last, and last it had. Madeleine Gardner smiled over at her. Well, Jane, what do you think? I think that the servants have been commendably diligent, Jane remarked, looking around. Yes, her aunt agreed. I am optimistic at what we will find upstairs. As they exited from the office, a young maid was emerging from the basement staircase across from them. Mrs. Gardner held out a detaining hand and said, Excuse me. Sally, mum, the girl replied as she dipped into a curtsy. Sally. Mrs. Gardner gestured at the stairs. What is down here? The maid glanced behind herself briefly. The kitchen, mum, and the servants' quarters beyond that. Very good, thank you. Mrs. Gardner said, and looked to her niece. Jane, I think we should inspect the kitchen as well. Jane nodded and followed her aunt down. Mrs. Bennet was rarely involved in the operations of the kitchen, preferring to give orders to their cook, but Jane herself understood the necessity of a well-working kitchen. It was the warmest room they had yet visited and hummed with activity, and Jane and Mrs. Gardner stood out of the way, observing quietly. The cook was a competent and brusque woman 
ordering about her underlings, who scurried quickly to obey, while the midday meal took swift shape beneath their hands. Tea will be ready for you, mum, the cook assured her new mistress, and turned to give orders to a young scullery maid. Mrs. Gardner, content, ascended back to the main house. There were five bedrooms upstairs, starting with the master's bedroom, long empty, the furniture covered by slightly dusty holland covers, but the windows clean. The mistress's suite, in pristine condition, was still filled with trinkets as though ready for its inhabitants' return at any moment. All three guest rooms were draped in white furniture covers, with a thin, fine layer of dust settled across the mantel and window sashes. Mrs. Gardner shivered, looking around the last room. Shall we go back down, Jane? I expect our tea is waiting. Jane turned from where she had lifted one heavy white cover to peer at the sturdy vanity and mirror beneath and let it drop. Yes, let us go down, she agreed, lifting her skirts to cross the room. The floor had been swept, but not particularly recently. Given that the room was unoccupied and closed up, there was little need. Jane glanced back as she attained the door. There was not enough dust for her to have left footprints. When they descended to the hall below, young Sally was lingering near the door of the drawing room. She ducked her head shyly and trotted down towards the kitchen, her heels clicking softly across the parquet. Mrs. Gardner pulled open the door to the pale purple room and a welcome heat washed out. Both women hurried over to the fireplace, settling gratefully into seats near the cheerful blaze. This was my aunt's favourite chair, Madeline remarked nostalgically, leaning back against the dark leather wing-backed chair. I remember seeing her sitting here with her embroidery in her hands, or at least until her rheumatism made it impossible. She was a very interesting lady, Jane said from her position on a small green settee as she stretched her hands toward the fire. It was fascinating hearing her stories of her time in France before the wars. Yes, she was a fine woman, her aunt agreed, and wiped a tear away from her eye. I will miss her. Jane gazed on Mrs. Gardner with sympathetic concern and said, I am so very sorry, aunt. She is better off where she is, of course, her aunt said. She was failing this last year, you know. She told me she was ready to join her husband in heaven, but I was very fond of her. In any case, I did wish to ask how you feel about Elizabeth's bequest being so very large compared to your own. Does that bother you? Bother me, Miss Bennet replied, her blue eyes wide with bewilderment. I had no anticipation that I would receive anything from Mrs. Simpson. Of course, I'm not bothered in the least, but instead I am extremely grateful. The door opened at this juncture, and the young maid entered with a tea tray, with Mrs. Ripley behind her. Madeline gestured toward a small table, and the maid carefully lowered the tea tray, then stepped back. Thank you, Mrs. Gardner said with a smile at the girl, and then turned her attention on Mrs. Ripley. I would like to speak to you before leaving for Cheapside. Are you available now? Yes, madam, she replied in a composed tone. Go along, Sally. The maid nodded and departed hastily, and Mrs. Gardner said, Please do sit down, Mrs. Ripley. I would rather stand, the woman stated, and folded her hands in front of her. As you wish, Madeline replied, and poured Jane a cup of tea with two lumps of sugar and herself a cup of tea with milk. Mrs. Ripley, my niece and I are very impressed with how well the house has been maintained since Mrs. Simpson's death. The housekeeper relaxed noticeably. Thank you, Mrs. Gardner. I am aware that Mrs. Simpson left you three hundred pounds in her will. Do you wish to continue working here, or do you intend to retire? I would like to continue working and keep the three hundred pounds for my old age. Excellent. If you are willing, I would appreciate it if you would continue to keep on here as housekeeper, and I will pay your wages along with the other servants. We are still uncertain exactly what we will do with the house, but clearly we do not wish to leave the building standing empty. I am willing. Thank you, Mrs. Gardner. Chapter 4 Drawing Room, Longbourn. 
Therefore, on Elizabeth's next birthday, she will be mistress of sufficient funds to provide seven hundred pounds a year in income, Mr. Gardner said. Silence fell, and Elizabeth, who had managed to regain at least some of her equanimity, allowed her eyes to drift from her mother to her three younger sisters. Mrs. Bennet was sitting bolt upright in her favourite blue chair, her eyes flared wide, her mouth gaping open. Mary, the only Bennet daughter who had not inherited their mother's beauty, was sitting on a small chair near the door. Kitty and Lydia, curled up on a settee by the fire, were also open-mouthed, but, not surprisingly, it was Lydia, the youngest and most boisterous, who spoke first. Seven hundred a year! Oh, Lizzie, you are, if not rich, at least quite well off now. You will be able to buy anything you want. Oh, you will share some of it with us, will you not? Please. Of course she will, Mrs. Bennet cried out, having recovered sufficiently to speak. Oh, we are saved, saved. Dear Lizzie, I am so thankful you did not accept Mr. Collins's offer. It would have been dreadful if he had been given control over such a sum. Now, my dear, you will want to buy some new clothes and some for your sisters as well. And, oh, you should rent a house in London for the season. Mrs. Bennet, Mr. Bennet said from his position near the fireplace, and his tone was sufficiently stern that his womenfolk immediately looked at him. This is Elizabeth's money, not yours, and not our other daughter's. Do not bother thinking of myriad ways for Lizzie to spend the money, because I will not permit it. Elizabeth released a soft sigh of relief and surprise. She had expected her mother, always extravagant, to make plans to spend her inheritance, but she had not expected her father to come to her rescue. But Mr. Bennet, Mrs. Bennet exclaimed, Lizzie owes it to us. She does not, her husband interrupted. Furthermore, as your brother said a minute ago, Elizabeth's bequest is currently held in trust until her birthday, so she cannot spend any of it now, even if she wishes to. Mrs. Bennet looked indignant for a moment, but she recovered quickly to say, well, that is quite all right. Lizzie will be one and twenty in August, so it is not a long wait. Oh, Elizabeth, how clever you were to write old Mrs. Simpson so regularly. We are saved from the hedgerows. Seven hundred pounds a year is a goodly sum, and with the two hundred from my marriage portion it is enough to live on. Praise God! Hill! Hill! Do come here and listen to the good news. Miss Lizzie has inherited money.'